So just a little bit background of uh, what we, where we come from. We are uh, not just working in infrastructure, we're also uh, working heavily with oil and gas industry. Uh, of using BIM and BIM integrated technologies. And actually, decades ago, oil and gas industry already using BIM before BIM was actually coined as a BIM. Um, and they were, re they were really uh, uh, advanced in that case, and, and, and later on, they didn't pick up um, quite a practice in the, in the field, unfortunately. And we're also working in the mining sector as well, using BIM for uh, sh the mine site shutdown maintenance as well as uh, for building industry. So I, I think, I think BIM is, is basically, um, technically speaking, BIM is more like octopus. Okay, so BIM is in the main body, but have a lot of arms. And then one arm can, in construction side, it can be like RFID. Okay, so because you need to understand where your materials is and where, how, when it actually arrived, where it's located in your warehouse, and, and who actually picked it up in, uh, in, the, in this morning. So radio frequency identification technology can be one practical arm. Another arm can be augmented reality. Okay, so whatever in digital information, you can project it into the site. Okay, you can project it using your Google Glass, you can project it using iPad as well. So that's another arm. There could be more arms like barcoding, uh, could be laser scanning, and many things. But the thing is, BIM itself is not enough. It got to have a lot of arms to make it fully integrated. And the brain of the body, the brain of the main body should be, you know, link thinking, could be link thinking or location-based thinking or other optimization techniques I can, I will share with you a little bit later. So, um, so basically, I, I report two uh, projects we are doing under uh, SBE. One is using BIM for smarter and safer scaffolding construction. Um, this is the list of the uh, participants, and uh, one of my students, uh, Jun Wang, has done a lot of work in, in here. So what happens is uh, we all know that scaffold is very important, right? And, and, uh, but very rare case that we consider course of practice in scaffolds, which could be a thick at this book, into the beam engine so that the beam can actually automatically create a, a, a safer scaffolds design based on the uh, constraints that you have in, in for example, the, the shape of the building as well as other parts of it. Okay, so, so that's, that's the unique part of this. And I always say that um, uh, we, we should implement, another example I have been doing with my industry is look at how mathematical modeling can be used to optimize the, um, the plant shutdown maintenance schedule. 48 hours, you have a lot of schedules, a lot of trades moving, 100 people. We model that in mathematical equations. Okay, and mathematics are very good at this, and then they can give you an ideal solution, you can shrink it down to 35, min, uh, 35 uh, hours. Is that feasible or not? We don't know, right? So we get, to get the experienced people come in to review the schedule to see if it's, it's practical or not. So if you look at constructability using BIM, the way that we do it is we invite a lot of people, experienced people into a workshop and then we look at the original schedule and see how we can improve. So what about the other way around? We get a lot of uh, you know, mathematicians optimize it Right? In another way, we put it very high, very ideal world, okay? And then we get a lot of experienced practitioners coming and bring it down to the practical ground. But that probably is still higher than, you know, bottom up. So that's, that's uh, I think that's a very interesting uh, way of thinking things and, and uh, it could work sometimes, especially in the time critical plant shutdown uh, case. So anyway, let's come back to, to this uh, scaffolding example. Uh, we. Uh, we decided to test uh, some of the principles through scenarios. One of the scenarios is to look at a modular design of scaffolds um, and different ways to modulate and, and put them up. And some contractors, some owners, they measure uh, by, uh, based on the volume, some based on the weight of the scaffolds, and that can um, be used as well. And the second scenario we look at is the, how we can, um, oh, this is, this is from our partners, uh, which is QUT, and, and in earlier stage is uh, based on the shape of the of the building. You can put the um, selected scaffolds type on automatically. And scenario three is basically look at. Um, in this case, you see this is the opening here. The, in, in in the middle picture, you see there's an opening square in there, and the the this tool can recognize it, 
And then it will say, oh, course of practice says there's opening there. You got put handrail, which is you know one meter high there. And then the system will put it on. So you see this rule based. We convert or translate the course of practice into the uh, beam engine, and the beam itself will actually uh, run it. So, so it will reduce a lot of human errors and, and emissions there. So how we can schedule um, and, and to organize the uh, temporal and spatial coordination of, uh, of the uh, plant equipment. And in this picture, you will see uh, the truck. On the right-hand side, the truck is, uh, is moving something, and it has to be a safety distance, maybe, I don't know, five or 10 meters from the corner of the scaffolds, otherwise it will hit. So this is also written down in the course of practice. But they all can be converted into a beam-compatible language. Uh, for the scheduling, which is, is quite um, uh, uh, typical applications, rather than using mobile crane in this case, you know, the tower crane can be put in the middle and then to do things quicker, put the scaffolds in. So there could be different scenarios tested in, in this case. And uh, using BIM for quantity takeoff, you know, and um, structure analysis and load calculation. Uh, fortunately that we win uh, ARC linkage grant, which was announced in uh, June based on this uh, project and so that can sustain us to continue this topic for another three years, um, which is part of the 3.38 uh, project. Um, the second project I want to share with you is uh, 3.28 is basically about developing the national beam guidelines for infrastructure in this country. And as Levi mentioned uh, earlier, that uh, we already got the guidelines in the building sector, right? And the companies follow that guideline, then develop their own uh, implementation plan. And that's exactly what we want to see it happen. So that's why the general the guideline was developed in a very general sense, and it can be used as a mother guideline for the uh, companies to develop their own version. So these are the uh, um, partners, as well as the uh, main um, uh, investigator. So we look at the uh, around the world. Okay, we found about 40 uh, beam guidelines, but they're all in, in building industry. Very few in infrastructure, unfortunately. So that's the one of the motivate we do this. And this is uh, the beam guideline cover, and this is quite broad and about 50 pages, uh, with another 20 or 30 pages appendix. Uh, we look at the um, look at the different uh, uh, types of the infrastructure along design, construction, and operation stages, and we identify about 41 uh, beam applications or uses in, the, uh, in, in, in this uh, arena. For example, you look at the uh, design, right? The beam can be used for site analysis for uh, road, can be used for uh, site authoring, design authoring, and other things. So this give, give you a, a, a holistic overall picture of what can be done in beam uh, in different uh, type of projects. And, and level of details, obviously, is, uh, is really dictated by the uh, user's uh, needs, and could come from the owner or the contractor. Um, we look at the, uh, the different four types of infrastructure. In this case, is uh, a road, tunnel, bridge, and, and highway, I think. And they're all different a little bit, but they're all linear infrastructure. But some of them are more um, <clears throat> contents defined, some of them are less. Uh, we developed this um, quality assessment model um, and so that we can go across different projects and sorting them. And this is an example of the road projects. Uh, basically, uh, look at how the uh, different different stages of the of, of the life cycle management can be managed through BIM according to the different stakeholders. Okay, it can be designer, owner, uh, consultants, and contractors. So it's, it's a is a matrix that has given the overall framework. And, and this, this guidelines, we are wrapping up, and, and uh, hopefully early next year, we're going to publish through uh, NetSpec or uh, Engineer Australia so that it can have the uh, maximum visibilities. And, and lastly, I want to uh, do a little bit <laughs> promotion for the director of uh, <laughs> LCIA. Um, we are running the uh, Global Lean Construction Conference. It's global, so it's big, and we're expecting about 500 to 1,000 people from all over the world. 50% academics, 50% uh, industry. We have about, we only have about 30 exhibition booths, 
So they might be running out very quickly. And uh, there's some co correlated the, um, events like International Group of Lean Construction uh, BIM Day Out, which is quite um, reputable uh, national events in, in, in here, and RFID journals as well as ITC. And it's, it's going to be co-hosted by Curtin and LCIA together. So uh, mark your diary and uh, we hope we can see you <laughs> in that big event. Thank you. Thank you.